Uh, hello everybody, uh, sorry for the short delay. I would like to say we were building anticipation, but actually there was a tech supposed to go set this up. But uh, thanks to our previous speaker, I seem to have something that's running. I, um, yeah, thank you. I'm not entirely sure if everything will be the right resolution, but you know, uh, I got here at 9 a.m. this morning. I'm on two hours of sleep, so we're par for the course at this point. So you're in the sense of consciousness. Exactly, uh, the best place to be giving a talk, yeah. <laughs> Um, this is also the first time I've ever given this talk, so we'll see how this goes overall. Uh, feel free to give me feedback. It's super chaotic, but short version. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is James Portnow. I am a game designer by trade. Uh, I've worked mostly on the entertainment side of the industry, so I've worked on games like the Call of Duty series, uh, Farmville, League of Legends, uh, stuff by Square Enix. But most people actually know me as an animated bean person on the internet because I write a show called Extra Credits where we teach about game design and history and literature to two million kids a week. Um, and today I want to talk to you about a promise we have to future generations. Uh, this promise to utilize everything we've learned from making games and film and television to do more than just kill the hours between work and sleep. Over the past century, we have spent hundreds of billions of dollars learning how to engage a human being. It's time we use that to make the classroom something that everybody wants to attend, school something that everybody wants to go to. Uh, so that's kind of the overall thrust of this talk. It's kind of going to be a talk in three parts. The first part is going to be about what we've done up to this point and why it may not be perfect. Um, the second part is going to be about how to use the psychology behind uh, games and entertainment to make the classroom in a more engaging place. Uh, things that we can do in any classroom that can be applied to any curricula that don't involve building games, don't involve actually spending any money, just understanding how to approach these differently, thinking about engagement. And then finally, uh, a bunch of people asked me to sort of do a section on what problems games can solve. If we're building games for the classroom today, what should we be building? If I'm buying games for the classroom today, what should I be looking for? So th that's crammed in at the end. Uh, so this will be that three-part talk. Um, since we're a little late, let's just dive into it. Let's start with this, uh, gamification. Many of you probably know this term. Uh, for those of you who don't, I'm going to dive in real quick. I'll go through it. Um, basically, it's primarily what I've seen for the classroom space so far. It's this idea of taking game-like elements and bringing them into a more serious context, whether it be workplace training or education or what have you. Um, this is very often things like badges and achievements and leveling trees and point systems and leveling up and leveling up. <laughs> but. The funny thing about this is, right, we've had these systems forever. Uh, right, <laughs> right. So, so you, years and years ago probably, have experienced badges before, right? And Weight Watchers has had a point system since they began. Uh, and for anybody who's like me and doing the conference circuit, I'm sure you've watched yourself level up and then cried about the amount of time that you're not at home uh, with any of your frequent flyer miles. So we've had these systems forever, right? Skill trees have been in since the dawn of RPGs. So why now? Why are we starting to try and bring these things into the classroom right now? And there's two parts to that. Part one is the fact that, I mean, to be honest with you, we're all scrambling, right? We're all working within a system that was built to bring an industrial age society, an agrarian society into the industrial age and not an industrial age society into our information age future. And now we're like, how do we kludge that system to make it work? So that way in the 21st century, people are getting what they need to learn. Simultaneously, when we started having that realization, these guys were huge. Um, <laughs> they were making headlines everywhere. New York Times, Time Magazine, a lot of people who were not uh, necessarily in touch with the game space were seeing what these guys were doing and were saying, well, this is so compelling to so many people. How can we learn from what they're doing and utilize that? <coughs> But the problem with exploring these games, the problem with examining these games, I, I worked on some of them. The problem with these games is they're all based on the research of one man, one Burhaus Skinner. Some of you recognize this. For anyone who doesn't know who B.F. Skinner is, he's the dude who put pigeons in boxes and got them to peck a button. Uh, basically, he looked at what Pavlov was doing. It was like, well, that's cool. You can make dogs salivate to a bell, rad, but that's an instinctual thing. 
I wonder if I can get something to do something that's an act of volition, right? Uh, pressing a button is not instinctual. Pressing a button is something that we usually think of as a choice. <coughs> and he was like, can I compel a creature to do something that we usually think of as a choice? And so he would put these birds in these boxes, and every time they would peck the button, they would get a pellet. And then over time, he would start reducing the number of pellets they would get for pecking this button. And he developed all sorts of systems and schedules to eventually get to the point where the birds would just peck the button. There would be no pellets coming out, and they would just spend all day pecking this button. <coughs> but the problem is that this is also the research primarily used by these guys, right? Uh, if you've ever been to Vegas, if you ever pulled the lever on a slot machine or watched anybody play, you're watching those reward systems in action. And you know what? Kids are not pigeons and schools are not slot machines. <laughs> so we have to be focused on engagement and not addiction. And addiction is a strong word. It's actually compulsion. But in case anybody was asleep by this point, I figured I'd throw it in. Um, fundamentally, I, as a designer, can build a reward system for you that will get a kid to do 10, 50, 100 math problems. What I can't do with that reward system is promise you they're going to get anything at all from doing those math problems. Why? Because what they're doing it for is the extrinsic reward and not because they want to be doing math. And for us to be successful, we have to get away from these extrinsic reward systems and get our students actually invested in the topics we are trying to teach. Um, and study after study after study after study has shown that extrinsic rewards are not only not effective, in many cases, they're actually harmful. One of my favorites is from the Leopard Green and Nisbet study that was done super early on, which says children who expect rewards for an activity are less likely to engage in the same activity later than those who are intrinsically motivated. And after a moment of thinking, right, this seems very obvious. I pay a kid five bucks to go read a history book. They may do it, but why are they doing it? They're doing it to get that five bucks. And next time there is not five dollars there, they're not that likely to go out to the library and go get a history book for themselves. And in fact, the way they're going to read that history book is the fastest, most efficient way to get the extrinsic reward because they're motivated by the $5 and not history. If I can get a kid uh, to be excited about history and get excited enough to go out to the library and get a history book for themselves, they're way more likely to go back and do that again and again if they enjoy those books. Um, so that's what we've got to be focused on. Which leads us to the principles of play. This part is going to be chaotic because there was way more than could possibly fit in here. But this is just to spark ideas. Things that we have learned from designing games that would be very easy to incorporate in the classroom. Uh, the first one to me, the most obvious, is just imagine a game where you have a million points to start. You just lose points and lose points and lose points and lose points. Ah, oh, it's a sad day, right? Um, I taught game design. If a student brought me that, I would fail them. And yet, I talk to students all the time. I go to universities, and all the time I talk to students, this is what they think they start the class with. Everybody thinks they come into class with an A, and just over time, lose score <laughs> and lose score. But this makes no sense, because human beings are more motivated when they watch themselves make progress than when they watch themselves fall further and further behind. It's actually not that hard to grade up instead of down and have people feel like they're at least achieving something, even if they're struggling, rather than just tell them, you're failing, give up, right? Uh, and so that's something that we can do. Another easy one, any piece of pop entertainment that you basically ever see at this point, uh, from Star Wars to The Godfather, The Beatles to Nirvana, anything that occurs over time occurs on a engagement and excitement scale that we've mapped out rigorously, right? We in the entertainment industry know that this is about, we have different, different industries call it different things, film industry calls it attention curve, but we know that this is about the level of excitement that a person wants to maximally engage with the thing that you're presenting them. Um, I talk to teachers a lot and I ask them, okay, how exciting should your classroom be? And they're like, as exciting as I can possibly make it. And that's actually false, right? It's kind of like Snickers bars. And the first one may be great, but after a half an hour of just eating Snickers bars straight, you're pretty ready to throw up. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about this a little bit, right? Uh, we got that scene at the beginning where the Star Destroyer is flying in. We all remember that moment from Star Wars. And then what happens next? Moisture farming, right? And you think we won't, don't care about moisture farming because it's boring. But no, in fact, we care about it 
because they gave us this earlier thing. And in a lot of classrooms, in a lot of lessons, we cannot make everything exciting all the time because the material itself, there are dull bits which you have to grind through. But if we can present things in such a way that we can put those dull bits in the natural lulls, in the place where the brain wants to sit back and actually not be as excited and still engage, we can do a lot. Now, it's a lot to ask teachers to, uh, to understand and plan around the entire sort of engagement curve and excitement curve that we usually use. But this part isn't hard, right? When I talked about the Star Destroyer, I saw a lot of you nod and be like, yeah, I remember that scene. Why do you remember that scene? Because it's the hook, right? If we start thinking about our lessons, beginning with the idea of why these students should care, what's exciting, what am I going to present to them today that is going to get them invested it, for as long as I can get them, if we can start with that, we can get people paying more attention for longer in our classrooms. And so even something as simple as making sure our lesson plans have a hook is going to do a great deal to encourage engagement. And then there's something that uh, we deal with a lot in the games industry, but you hear about sports players and uh, musicians and artists talk about a great deal, which is being in the zone, right? I don't think I've ever talk to a student who was like, oh man, yesterday I was doing my homework and I was so in the zone. <laughs> but why not, right? Um, in the games industry, we actually know uh, that this is something that you can build. Uh, there's actually been a lot of psychological research about how to get somebody in the zone. Uh, it's called Flow. I'm going to butcher the fellow's name, but there's a great book on it, also called Flow, by a guy named Chiksak Mihai, uh, who established, he studied all sorts of sports players and even like factory workers and stuff, and found that there's this channel we get into when the challenge level of our tasks is appropriate to our skill level. And that may seem super obvious, right? Uh, challenge is too high for your skill, you're going to start failing at it, you're going to be anxious about it, you're not going to do your best work. You get bored and nobody while bored is achieving at their highest level. But if you can actually maintain that flow channel, you can get somebody in the state where they're breaking barriers, where retention is super high, uh, where they're achieving at their highest level. So the key to this, as we've learned in games, is it has to occur over time, right? In a game, we start you off with a simple challenge, and we actually study each level, each section of our games, and watch our players play it and say, OK, if you're playing this game, how much are you improving at your skill every time we have you jump over a pit? Because you're getting better at jumping over a pit every time we have you do it. So the next pit is going to be a little bit wider. And we measure that to make sure you stay in this flow channel. Now, we can't achieve this for all students. But man, I was flipping through my nephew's uh, math textbook. And I was looking at the problem sheets, right? And they were all over the place. Problem one was often harder than problem five. Problem five was often easier than problem three. Like, that makes sure that nobody ever gets here. Um, all we have to do is reorder our problems, thinking about things like this in order to allow some students to have that feeling, which is a great feeling. Right? You feel really positive if any of you have ever experienced that being in the zone. You feel really positive about those moments that you're in the zone. So if we can do that, we can achieve a great deal. Um, and then this is a tangent. I, it's a very personal tangent to me, so you're going to indulge me for five minutes. Um, I think it's very important that we also use the games they're already playing. Uh, games are like television or anything else, right? You sit a kid in front of television for eight hours a day as a babysitter. They're probably going to watch garbage, and they're not going to get a lot from it, right? Uh, that's not true for everybody, but probably true. You sit with them, you talk about that TV, and there's actually a lot that you can get out of that. Games are exactly the same way. If you can engage with your students, if you can engage with your children about these games, best would be to play them with them. But if you don't feel confident in that, just let them talk. Give them a moment to talk about their games. And as you hear them talk about these games, there'll be all sorts of things that you can pull out that are actually real world lessons that they're just going to completely miss if they uh, don't have somebody working with them. How many of you guys recognize this? OK, so we do have some people willing to admit they play magic. Yes. Um, it sounds silly, but this card changed my life. Uh, I was playing, I was like 13 years old. I was playing with a buddy of mine. It was taking forever to take his turn. And so I read this card. And I don't know if you can see in the back, but it says at the bottom, there are some qualities, some incorporate things that have a double life, which thus is made. A type of twin entity, which springs from matter and light, evinced of solid and shade. Edgar Allan Poe, silence. 
And you know what I did when I read that card? I actually, it was, the language was just so much more powerful than any of the hack fantasy or sci-fi I've been reading up to that point. I ran out to the library and I got this book. And then you know what I did? I got every book they quoted in this game. Why? Not because anybody said, you have a test on this. Not because anybody sat me down in a classroom and made me study this. But because it was presented to me in a context I was inherently engaged in already. Uh, and I ended up getting my major in classics because I wanted to read all of this stuff. Uh, I have a master's in entertainment technology that I don't use anywhere near as much as the lifelong love of classics that this sort of thing uh, sort of instilled in me, right? So I might have totally missed that. I just happened to luck out and get excited about it and have this moment where my, my friend was taking forever. If I had a parent or a teacher who was able to help like, have that conversation with me and call that out, that would have been great. In fact, one I did miss, how many of you guys recognize this? Okay, so we got a couple. We've actually have more magic players than programmers in this room. I very rarely get to talk to those rooms. That's awesome. Um, so this is how memory management works in a, uh, in a computer. But it's also how one of the systems in Magic the Gathering works. It's called the stack. And the first time somebody in my professional life showed me this, I, I had this moment of revelation. I was like, oh, I got it, right? I totally understand that because I've been playing with it for 10 years. If someone had told me that before, I would have been much less wary of computer science. I was not a computer science person. Uh, to this day, if you let me touch memory management, we all die. Uh, but I can script. <laughs> I can script pretty good. Um, and so, but if somebody had told me that, I would have been less intimidated by it, which is a huge thing that I could have gotten from these games. And this is not limited to any particular subject, right? I have seen kids do really high level math trying to figure out World of Warcraft builds. Um, I have seen, economics taught at the university level through StarCraft. I've seen kids lean in and get excited about history through uh, civilization. And I've even seen the dullest of subjects, city planning, made excited by what we do. Um, and so if you can have that conversation, if you can take that moment and listen and try and figure out, okay, there's things to talk about, about teamwork here, about uh, logical thinking, about history or science or all these other things. If you can have that conversation with them, we can turn something that they may spend already 40 hours a week into partially educational, right? If we can recover 10 hours out of that 40 hours, if we can recover 25% of the time they spend on games as educational time, that's an incredible benefit to all of us. Um, so let's go back out of that tangent and talk about real engagement, right? Why do we care about these subjects? How do we uh, start figuring out not how to get people to do the work, but rather how to get them to engage in the subject itself. Uh, and this is the only thing by me I'm gonna put up here, but fundamentally, I think it's true. I think we spend too much time trying to make kids learn things and not enough time spent thinking about why they might wanna learn them. And if you're involved in entertainment, the very first question you ask on a game, on a film, on a television series, before it gets greenlit, before you start really doing any work on it is, why? Why do they care, right? What is going to make people passionate about this? And I think that's very, uh, that's something that we should be doing at the outset of any of our lessons. And I know, right, like I talk to public school teachers who are super overtaxed all the time. I know this is difficult. I know that uh, finding any time to get kids to do something more than just actually sit there and do the work you need them to do is difficult. But I think that if we can do this, we also save a lot of time elsewhere. Uh, I was once asked to work on uh, a project with young women who were sort of struggling with STEM. It was uh, this summer program where they took uh, a group of young girls who were uh, not doing as well as they had hoped in their science courses and tried to get them engaged in, in the sciences. And they asked me, can you create a game or a lesson that's gonna help get these uh, young women excited about science? And my answer was actually, uh, probably not, but it sounds like a really interesting problem, so I'll try. Um, but I walked into the classroom, I thought about it a lot, right? And I walked into the classroom, and I brought this big old box of beads with me. And I sat down with these young ladies and said, all right, let me tell you this story. Let me tell you about this tribe. And there's this tribe where every year uh, on your birthday, you 
get to add a bead to, the, to your necklace. And it's a ritual. Um, it's a very specific ritual. And so there's very specific uh, requirements in terms of what color and shape and size beads you get to add to this necklace. And then I said, can you make the necklace for your age? And they got really excited, right? They all dug through the box of beads and grabbed all the strings and started putting them together. And it was amazing because I saw them each help each other. And uh, every time somebody would screw up, some of them, one of them would go, oh, I actually think the pattern's like this. And so I said, OK, can you make one for somebody who's 20? And they would all go do it. And then I was like, can you make some, one for somebody who's 45? And they got super excited and were making these big necklaces. And it was awesome. And then the next day I came in and told them that was electron shells. That was all the rules for electron shells. Um, substantially more advanced than we actually ever talk about all the way through the high school level. We, because we had color and shape and size, we could do suborbitals, we could do all this stuff. And then I showed them a periodic table and was like, you've seen this in all your classrooms. You've seen, you actually know how to do all of this, right? Um, in that moment, I got to say to them, all right, build me phosphorus, right? And they were able to do it. Build me zinc. And they were able to do it. And sometimes I saw them actually drawing out the necklaces in their notebook. Um, but they could still help each other. And all of a sudden, what we had taken away, and this is an important one, is that sometimes disengagement doesn't actually come from disliking the subject or being bored by the subject. There are external things, right? For a lot of these young women, they had been told by either society or by their family that science wasn't for them, that they weren't going to be good at it. And so I'd walked into the classroom disengaged. And so we had to find some way to break through that barrier and engage them in it. And they were, they were ace at it, right? They were great. They could do the whole periodic table, no problem. Um, but what was, oh yes, you have a thought. Actually, um, I was going to ask, can you back one slide? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, I want to get a picture of that in the next one. <laughs> All right, and this one? Yeah. And now, <laughs> now we're going to talk about the real kicker because what blew my mind was something I didn't realize. Because at the very end of this class, a young woman came up to me and she said, for the first time, I understand why science is beautiful. Everyone had always tried to uh, get her into science by telling her all the things it would allow her to do or by telling her about the cool logical problems she could solve. She was completely capable about so of solving the logical problems, but it was engaging to her. But when she saw that the world was made up of these like beautiful jewels and that they came together in a larger and larger pattern to create this, this cosmos that we have that was this incredible structure out of these tiny pieces. That was beautiful to her. And all of a sudden, she was really excited to go home and learn science. And so we need to look through and really ask ourselves to reconsider why someone wants to learn these things and not just keep trying to get them to do the work that we consider learning something. Um, all right, so with that, let's talk about the problem game solve. This is going to be a radical departure, but I had a bunch of people ask me, OK, we're building a game, or I'm buying a game for classrooms. What should I actually be looking for, or what should I be building? And so I've been thinking about this a great deal. And there are some things that games are really good at, and some things that games are uh, possibly not the best for doing. And just so we're clear, games will never replace teachers. It doesn't matter how good a game we make. We need someone there, work, we need a human being working with students. Um, I've had people worried about that in the, in the past. I don't think we're, the teacher is essential to the classroom. I don't think we can ever move away from that model. That said, there are some things that are systemic issues with the way that we're currently teaching, inheriting from this 19th century system that games are actually sort of better at that allow us to do uh, more easily. The first off to me is focusing on solutions and not retention. In the palms of our hands, uh, on our cell phones, on the internet, in Wikipedia, we have access to more raw data than all the libraries of the 19th century. When our system was established, a lot of it was about memorization because when you went back to your small town or when you were even a clerk in your store, you couldn't necessarily immediately reference uh, even a, a multiplication table, right? So you needed to have it all in your head. Today, the problem that faces our students, especially if they're going to get the type of jobs we want them to get, is not one of retention, not how much data you can store in your head. It's right, how you can use that data to find solutions for problems. And this is what games are all about, right? 
Uh, games basically are exactly this. They're a set of data that we give the player and say, how do you solve problems with that data, right? How do you beat this boss? How do you get over this pit? How do you make this Tetris, right? Um, and so when you're building your games, if you're building flashcards with a game skin, you're doing it wrong. Fundamentally, your games should be utilizing the principle of games that allows us to be solution focused. Any game for the classroom, in my opinion, should be solution focused because it should get the students to start actually exploring uh, how they utilize all the data they have at hand in a more confined space to solve the problems that are gonna confront them. Because uh, in the rest of the century, there's a lot of problems that nobody's ever solved before that our students today are gonna to have to solve. Um, next, this concept of iterative learning. Uh, so right now we have this issue where you get this, a week later, you get that. Great. Um, this, is an, this is a problem because that sort of time for feedback doesn't give us the opportunity to have iterative learning. Uh, if you're a student and you get a grade on your paper, a lot of times, because teacher's time is crunched, they don't have time to regrade it, so you don't even get to go back and fix your mistakes. But if you do, well, a week later, none of us remember exactly why we made the, the errors we made, what we were thinking at the time. We may now know better, or just by pointing out that they're wrong, we may learn and be able to do it better, but we don't remember why we're thinking what we, what we were thinking initially. This is different than in games, right, where you have immediate feedback cycles, and immediate feedback cycles allow you to iterate on that problem. I think this is the answer. Oh, I lost. I have to try and figure, see if I can figure out a new answer, and so I have to think about why my previous answer was wrong, which allows me to learn. This is another problem this time for VI Creates. When we have a testing environment, when we have a homework environment where you get one shot at things, we create a fear of failure. But the problems of the 21st century are not problems of can you get it absolutely perfect on the first try. The problems of the 21st century are can you get me the best possible solution in the fastest possible time? And to do that, you have to fail, get up, learn from that failure, and try again. And if we paralyze students who, and make them afraid of trying things because they might fail, that is a great injustice we do to our students. And we can solve that by the immediate feedback cycles that games give you. Um, another one is that we use homework as an assessment, right? For the most part, or at least a lot of homework is, tends to be about trying to see if the students have learned whatever they were supposed to learn in the last week. Well, that doesn't actually teach anything. It gives us an important point of data. It gives us, as teachers, an understanding of whether or not we're being effective. But if students are doing two to four hours of homework every night, it would be great if some of that or more of that could be used to actually learn things. And the way to learn things from that, as we've just talked about, is that moment where you fail, you think about why you failed, and try something new, and keep iterating on your thinking. Games are really good at this cycle. Um, and so all of your games you should be buying or building should involve this cycle. Define your question. Okay, uh, how do I get across that hallway? Gather information. Well, there's an enemy here, here, and here. Form hypothesis. I think I run this way to get across this hallway. Test hypothesis. Run this way. Uh, analyze data. I died. Um, interpret data. That was not the way to get across this hallway. Publish results, press continue, retest, right? Try with a new hypothesis. That should be the cycle that your players are going through um, because that should also be the cycle that we should be going through if we can in a both classroom environment and in a homework environment. So utilizing the ability for games to give you immediate feedback to allow players to learn from failure is a key thing we should be doing with our educational games. Uh, next, tailoring lessons. So I taught for a couple of years at the college level, and I had small classes, right? I had like 30 people in my class. But even with 30 people in the class, I had this issue that I knew as I was designing lessons that those lessons were imperfect for some of the people in the class. I tried to do the best I could for as many people as I could. I tried to get as many learning methods as I could into those lesson plans, but you cannot tailor your lesson for everyone. The great thing is games allow us to give what we call context sensitive feedback to players. Um, so this message you see, pull right trigger to fire from the hip, doesn't pop up unless they're like moused over this particular target. So it's context sensitive. It comes up only when needed. This becomes important uh, because in games, there's this very common thing, right? Uh, jumping across a pit or your first challenge in which you have to jump. 
we encounter this thing where most players know this, right? No, most players understand how to do this. So they run, they jump across the pit, and great, they're done. Um, or they jump over this wall. But a small percentage of players will end up running into the wall or stopping at the pit and not going any further. Right, we do have people like that. But if someone stopped for 15 seconds, we've analyzed, we've looked at the player pattern and the user case for what that means. We understand, we've watched players do it, and we understand what they need. And so if you stop there for 15 seconds or not doing anything, we'll pop up on the screen, press B to jump, right? And then they know exactly what they need to do, so we can give them a hint when they need it. And not only can we do that, but we can also uh, put in various different learning methods, right? There are some people who learn better from modeling. And so if I press, put, press, if I put press B to jump and they still aren't jumping, then a couple seconds later, I can have a character run across the screen with a little B icon flashing over their head as they do the jump. And then the player watches it and then feels comfortable doing it, right? So you can put a lot of different learning methods in there. Um, and then if you're really trick, and this is a little bit more expensive, but if you're really trick, you can mail the teacher, right? You could have the game kick out an email to the teacher saying, okay, here's all these challenges. Here's the places where your player needed, your student needed a little bit of help. Uh, here's the different methods we tried. Here's the ones that were successful, right? And then here's where they got stuck and none of our methods worked. Here's a good place that you should probably have some one-on-one -on -one time or conversation with them to help them through it. Uh, that sort of feedback is super useful for any teacher and something that we can do in a game to sort of tailor the lessons to the learning style and the learning speed that our players are at. Um, so if you can incorporate that into your game, it's a little bit more difficult, but very powerful. Uh, and then there's the 20th, 21st century skills. Fundamentally, games are actually good at delivering 21st century skills. For those of you guys who are not aware of the 21st century skills, basically there was this enormous study done of universities and um, businesses, corporations, this sort of thing, asking what do we need to be an effective uh, citizen in the 21st century? And I understand there's some debate over whether or not this is, was an adequate study, but that said, the things they got back were critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and problem solving. Well, I can't think of four things that our students are practicing more every single day just by playing games, but because we never call it out, there's no transference. That none of that stays with them when they get up off the couch. But still, like if you watch somebody play Portal, any level they play in Portal is going to be an exercise in critical thinking. Um, if you've ever seen some kids play a MOBA together and be shouting at each other, they're practicing their communication. And this is a game where you will lose if your communication is worse. It is a communication-based game. Um, and having that conversation with them can help get them there. Uh, as far as collaboration goes, there's a lot of games that emphasize that you cannot get through challenges without actually working collaboratively. A Way Out is one of them where you can't actually succeed without relying on and working with, with your partner. Um, another great one for this is a game called uh, Never Alone, which was a game sort of about uh, Inuit mythology and culture, which was great on its own, but also had a lot of elements of, we had this asymmetric play where the two players had different abilities and you had to work together to utilize both of your abilities in order to solve all the puzzles in it, showing you again how cooperation is key to solving anything. And then finally, um, since this came up, I think a little bit in the last lecture, let's talk Minecraft. Um, I have witnessed students start playing Minecraft and they start off real simple trying just to copy whatever they see from their YouTuber uh, or just trying to build real small structures. And then a year or two in, they're building these just fantastic castles and whatever they can imagine. And you can think of it like Legos, right? Uh, you give a kid a set of Legos and often they first start just trying to timidly like build whatever the Lego kid is. But if they get into Legos, they just start, they don't even look at the kid, they just look at what Legos they got and then build the thing that they want to build which is great. I am a firm believer, although the science is still out on this, uh, that we can improve, that creativity is not something you are simply born with, or at least it's not binary. You're not either a creative person or an uncreative person. That we can actually improve creativity through the practice and work on creativity. Uh, Minecraft is a great example of this. Some of the research I've seen so far says we're struggling with 
making that transference on that creativity. There are kids who will become incredibly creative in Minecraft and then freeze up when you ask them to do a painting or something of that nature. And so we still have to work a little bit on that, but games are really good at allowing self-expression, whether it's your character design, what clothes you wear, or the ability to build things in your game. So that's something that you should also be looking to put in. Um, but perhaps most of all, it's the smallest thing, something that sort of got left out of that 21st century skills, but really impressed me one time. I was working with a friend of mine, and she was teaching down at, uh, in Oakland. And everybody was trying their best. Like, people were heroically struggling to make it a good school. But it was one of those schools where pregnancy just happened, and you didn't go to college. And like, there was a time where a kid came up to us and said they couldn't do their homework because they had been hiding out in a bathtub because people were shooting outside. Uh, right. And so it was one of these places at where there were a lot of challenges set up against the students. But what I realized, I brought in Super Mario Brothers. They wanted to teach me, have me teach the scientific method. So I brought in Super Mario Brothers and had the game, kids play it. They got really excited about the idea of just playing Super Mario Brothers in class. Wow, we don't really do class. We're going to do Super Mario Brothers, even though that was class. Um, but I watched this one kid. And he runs and he jumps and he falls in the pit. He runs and he jumps and he falls in the pit. And he runs and he jumps and he tries something a little bit different. And he gets over the pit. And the thing that was incredibly powerful about this, it didn't kick the door wide open, but it just pushed it open a little bit to have this conversation. That that was his life, right? That he could try different things and get different results, which may sound super obvious to anyone in this room, but a lot of the uh, schools that are struggling that I've been to, a lot of kids are very focused on the moment they're in and seeing the actual consequences, seeing that they have agency over their own life is a very difficult thing in a lot of cases. Um, we have this moment where, uh, when we're talking about it, we talked about college, and this kid did want to go to college, and he started out thinking that this was completely impossible. And as we talked, and as we talked about the game, he realized that there is some path. It may involve some luck. It may involve, it may be a lot harder than any of the other paths, but there are some things he can do that he has some control over about whether or not he gets to do that. And that was an incredibly, incredibly powerful thing, right? Games are really good at compressing time and showing you the consequences of your choices. Uh, fundamentally, if you're a freshman, if you're 14, it's hard to see that something that you did then and realize that something that you did then is going to affect your chances for college and maybe your whole life. Um, but in a game, you get that feedback right away. You get to know that by making a different choice, the world changed. And that's an important thing. If we can give people agency, I think we can fulfill part of the mission of education. Because to me, education is fundamentally about two things, about inculcating a lifelong love of learning and about giving people the tools and the ability to create the life they want to create. And for that, you need agency. So with that, I know we're short on time. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts, questions, anything any of you guys you have. Oh, thank you. Over there. When you said about the transfer out of Minecraft, a sculptor might be equally uncomfortable with me. Right. Would you That's true. Well, so that's what's really fascinating, right? Um, I've been wondering about this because I would be uncomfortable sculpting. Like, I was a musician in my youth, right? You asked me to, like, play guitar, great. But I'm not sure that's because of a failure on, because it's untransferable or because we haven't figured out yet how to make that transference, which is something I'm very curious about. Um, but yeah, other thoughts or questions? How long do we have left, by the way? When was this supposed to end? Are you the next speaker? I'm the next speaker. And I'm cutting into your time? Well, in that case, I apologize. Feel free to catch me at the rest of this conference, or you can email me at my extra credits email, and I would love to hear from all of you. Thank you so much for this. You are a lifesaver. Thank you. So I have, I hand you the USB back, right? I think, right, because that one's, yeah. I just want to say thank you for your channel. Oh, thank you so I much. I love your Wendigo videos, your Siege of Vienna. <laughs> that's, that's awesome because when we actually started putting history on, our YouTube rep called us up and said, you can't put history on this channel. You're going to kill this channel. You can't put history on a gaming channel. I was like, right. We said, you don't know this audience. Your history, your mythology. Yep. Uh, let me give you this back. No, I'm super appreciative. I'm super glad it gets some help. Um, and you are? Molly. Excellent. And uh, you, you need to see her? Yeah. Uh